Welcome to Ultimate Monday. Yay. All right, some some Ultimate Monday birds, uh, a collection of them: a, a mountain bluebird, a broad-billed hummingbird, a piping plover, uh, and a little shorebird. We have a, a raven. And uh, one of the ways you can tell the difference between a raven and a crow is that ravens have these like ruffles uh, on their neck, and crows do not. We also have a yes. Aren't ravens like huge? Too? They are bigger, but unless you see them side by side, it might be a little hard to judge. Um, but yes, ravens are much bigger. Uh, Red-headed woodpecker, uh, appropriately named in this case. Uh, some ruddy ducks, and finally a red-winged blackbird uh, making its uh, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> um, and if you're if you're ever walking uh, down by uh, Northfield High School, kind of across the street is an area of, kind of reeds. A bit of wetland has been preserved, and there's always a bunch of red-winged blackbirds hanging out there at this time of year. All right. So, uh, agenda for today is to uh, talk about uh, some different ways to design a parallel program and different things we have to think about in terms of efficiency and correctness. Uh, and then, uh, I think it's uh, a nice way to put in context some of what we've been studying is to contrast Java and C. How does Java represent things in memory? How is that different? How does that impact the language? Uh, but before we get to any of that, uh, are there any questions on the, the lab or other stuff? Okay. You did so the like original where we I was kind of pick up from that, right? And then it would just like like it just fall for a bit, like it just off. Like and then what basically what we're trying to ask is like does the server response always contain like the the specified header that we have which is like method of profit line call? Uh, well, the response does not include method. That, that's the request. The response is different, but it always starts with a response line, and then some headers, and then a blank line, yeah. and then the body of the response. Uh, question? Sorry. Uh, so you think that we should always have an HTTP version of 1.1 request? Or uh, 1.0. 1.0. Um, if were as the proxy. If the client was reaching out to the proxy request HTTP 1.1, should we send back a uh, header of 1.1 or should we keep it 1.0? Uh, the proxy can do everything in 1.0. Uh, Nick? For testing, uh, if I want to write a test case for, like, if they, if they use someone doesn't include a port and I want to just try and connect them on port 80 um, to some HTTP server. Uh, should I do that? Should I spin up Tiny on port 80, or should I connect to some like generics and other port 80 server out there? Um, um, yeah. So I think you could spin up Tiny on port 80, uh, but if some other service on Mantis say is using port 80, then that won't work in that case. Um, most Websites only support HTTPS, a much more complicated encrypted protocol, um, which you are not expected to, your proxy should, doesn't need to deal with. Um, but if you, um, uh, with some Googling, you can find there are a handful of public sites that still can use HTTP. Uh, so that would be one option. Um, yeah, so I think that would be, uh, yeah, th th I think those are the two ways to go there. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. well, uh, something I'm curious about is that um, sometimes when I try to write from proxy to client, I specify to write 70 bytes, but it only writes like um, 67 bytes. Is there a reason why like, I would be writing less bytes than I have less bytes? Um, 
Not that I can think of, so um, I'd be happy to look at that after class, but I'm not sure why that would be happening. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. So when you said that we have an expected file report for when we're running it, is it just falling properly or is it because of the timing server? So, like why like the reason why we have an expected file report? Or the Like in a curl command or in a curl command, yeah. Um well, so both the proxy and the and the tiny server are listening for connections on a particular port. And so that's not default. Like what is what is like what is responsible for like assigning the port to the to the request when it is like when we we are not really fine with it. Like I'm not I'm not like doing I'm trying to like do a test like write a test report for it, but I just curious of like okay like when I call the stuff on the tiny boot on the port, it is supposed to be sending something back or I am my supposed to uh like have port or the um, I mean, so the way that Tiny works is that you can't run the program without giving it a port. Mm -hmm. So you have to give it a port, and then it will only listen on that particular port. All right, so let's think about uh, the task where we have Uh, we have an array of 2 to the 30th, so about a billion integers. And we want to compute the sum. And because this array is pretty big, we want to explore how could we use multiple threads to compute the sum faster. Uh, so We'll do this by looking at just the part of the program that is the function each thread runs. Like, what are we going to have each thread do? And so, the signature of this function needs to take a void star and return a void star since every, uh, since every p thread that we create has to run a function with this signature. So kind of whatever argument we actually want to pass it is going to be passed as a void star, and we'll kind of deal with that in here. And the way each thread is going to know which part of the array it should sum up, because if we kind of want to divide up the work, we need to maybe assign each thread a different part of the array to sum up. So we're going to say each thread is going to have an ID, and uh, we're going to say that this argument, this void star, is going to be a pointer to that integer ID for that thread. So to get that out, we'll cast arg to uh, a pointer to an integer, and then dereference it to retrieve the integer. And then we're just going to use this ID to get two indexes. The start index of the larger array, where this thread should start summing up, and the end index, where it should stop. So two indexes give us sort of the portion of the array that this thread's going to sum up. So we'll get a start, and it will be my ID times the ID times this global variable n elements per thread. So we're just going to have some global variable that tells us how many elements each thread is uh, going to sum up. And my, the thread IDs will just start from zero on up. And so sort of each thread will start at kind of a multiple of this and elements per thread that kind of start at a different one of these chunks. 
And then we need to get our n index, which is just the index that we start at, plus the number of elements per thread. So to put this in concrete terms, if we had, say, a thread 1, or rather a thread 0, and a thread 1, thread 0 would start at 0, as it would be its ID of 0 times our element per thread. And if we just had two threads for our 2 to the 30th elements. We'd have half of those for each thread. So 2 to the 29th is sort of the index where the first thread would stop. And then we'd have 2 to the 29th up to 2 to the 30th as the uh, 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 remainder for the second thread. But, um, are there, I assume there are uh, things that we build in so that we wouldn't go beyond our array? Uh, we are calculating this number of elements per thread from the number of threads in the total elements. So we're going to divide up exactly how many elements are in the array. Uh, so where are you thinking we might go past the end? Where's the number of, I guess I'm confused because the difference between, oh no wait, no, it's dividing it by two. Never mind. No, I got, yeah. Okay. Alexander? Um, yeah. I'm not sure if this is what I was just asked, but why is it two to the 29th and not like two? Uh, because if we have 2 to the 30th and we divide it by 2, that's one less power of 2. So half of 2 to the, like half of 2 squared is 2 to the 1st. Half of 2 to the 10th is 2 to the 9th because we divide it by 2. So this is actually one half of the, of the total. Charlie? I think I'm a bit confused about what arg is here. Is that like the start of the array? Uh, so when we do... When we call pthread create to create a new thread to do some part of this summing task, uh, it takes four different arguments. But for our purpose, we care about two. We care about the function that we want this thread to run. So that's going to be sum. And then we also need to provide it the actual argument that it will take in, which for, and that's just going to be an integer starting at zero. There's going to be this ID that's going to be how we divide up the total array. So it would be either 0 for thread 0, uh, or 1 for thread 1. And that's going to get passed as a void star. Um, and so what we're, we're actually doing something like um, some space for this argument and then assigning it to say zero and then passing the pointer to zero here and then dereferencing it inside that function. So it's just a way to get this number that each thread needs to tell it which part of the array to handle. Uh, that's how we pass it using this pthreads library. Other questions? Oh, I don't know if this is where we're going, but how would this impact? Like, why do we want to do this? Because maybe I'm just having a conceptual misunderstanding here. But can't the computer can like only do one thing at a time? And like, we're not doing less sums by dividing them. Uh, that's a good point. If we only have one core, one CPU, oh, okay. we can do one thing at a time. But here we're in a world we have two, four, eight, thirty-six, some number of uh, cores, each of which can be doing something at the same time. So if we have two threads each summing up half the array, they can actually be doing that literally at the same time. All right, so let's finish out this sum function. I'm going to have a 
for loop, or i equals star, i less than n, so just loop through the indexes from start up to end, i plus plus. And in this version, we just have a global variable that I've called global sum, and we're just adding on So, um, yeah, uh, just to simplify this a little bit, um, instead of an array, we're going to say simplify the task a bit and say we're just going to sum the numbers from 0 up to 2 to the 30th. So we'll just use the index as uh, the, the thing that we're um, thing that we're summing up, um, uh, but we could uh, easily kind of use this as an index into uh, into into some array. Um, but sort of to keep this simple and not have kind of too many different parts of memory involved, we'll just use this the, this uh, integer out. Uh, where would the Yes, my very next question is going to be: Will this work? Or is there some problem? BJ says there's a race condition. Why is that? Because say if like this, like if that zero is trying to add to the whole time, that one is also trying to add to the whole time, but then Tom is might be like overwriting the other. Exactly. That this. <laughs> This addition to this global variable is not an atomic operation, which means that we can be partway through adding i to global sum and then switch to the other thread. So here's a, a little puzzle for you. Talk to your neighbors and see what is, we know there's this race condition on global sum. Let's say there are two threads. What is the smallest result we could have for global sum? Like, what is the like, what is the smallest it could possibly be after both threads have finished running? <clears throat> Something to get you started is that this. global variables in memory somewhere. So each of these additions includes a read, an add, and a write. We need to read the current value from memory, add i to it, and then write the result back. And try and come up with kind of the, in some sense, like worst case scenario where we end up kind of losing the most number of these additions. So how could we, like, what is the interleaving of all these different read and writes between these two threads that would give us the smallest end result for global sum? Uh, oh. Are we assuming that, like, all the numbers, like, the array in ascending order, or not? Uh, in, in this case, we're just adding the numbers from 0 up to 2 to the third here. OK. So, for example, thread one could read the current value of global sum, but before it does the addition, the thread the computer switches to running thread zero, and thread one is now paused, sort of in between read and add, until some later time when we switch back to it. Uh, they could also happen at the same time. But I'm asking for what is the scenario that gives us the smallest result for global sum? Uh, all right. Uh, 
Well, my initial guess is that that's the goal to like the bottom number we could get is just the sum of the graph zero. But uh, no, no, I, I'm trying to think of a way to be smaller than that. But uh, yeah, do you have a how, like what kind of interleaving of these would give us just the zero result at the end? Um, well, uh, red one reads, and then that would be. Zero, and then the thread. Like both of them read. Um, so they both read zero. They both start. They both get zero, and then thread one runs up to the end and just computes the sum of two to put the integration to the well, and then writes. And then yeah, so thread one. That read, yeah. Yeah. So then thread zero. Does extend. It's done, and we get um, yeah zero plus okay. one plus two to the twenty nine minus one. We, we're going up to but not including the end. Um, yeah, so this is definitely a way that all the work of thread one is just overwritten and ignored. Uh, oh, were there other possibilities? Folks, yeah, hey. um, so if both threads read zero at the start, um, and then thread zero completes everything from zero to one before the last element, so two to the 29th minus two, okay. um, and then it doesn't read yet for the last one. Uh, if thread one um, writes its first element, so two to the 29th, And then thread zero so this happens here. And then thread zero reads that value. And then the rest of thread one completes. And then thread zero finishes the last element. And so this is going to write. 2 to the 29th plus 2 to the 29th minus 1. Yeah. So this would give us 2 to the 30th minus 1. Uh, I think that's definitely smaller than uh, the total sum of, of thread 0. Uh, and this is kind of the, the, the takeaway from something like this is that when we have a multi threaded program, we can't rule out all of these different situations as being possible, at least when we have a, a race condition like this. So we could end up with what seems like a very bizarre result, a result that would seem like, well, maybe only one of these threads is even running. But what's actually happening is there, uh, the specific order in which these non-atomic operations are taking place is causing us to lose a lot of the additions that we've done. Uh, other comments or questions? Yes. So for the first one, right? Um, so 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 does it go to uh, to the program and to does it go to that step and then it's already written stuff in right? or no? Are you doing right here? Uh, to the left back. So it's right zero. Yeah, so it, it, re it does all the complete operations up to this point. So it has written the sum from 0 up to 2 to the 29 minus 2. Uh, but then thread 1 overwrites that with 2 to the 29 with its first, uh, first step. Um, and then thread 0 reads that result, but before it actually does something with that, thread 1 finishes its work. So now thread one has done a bunch of updates that thread zero is not aware of. And then thread zero overwrites them. Other questions? All right, how can any suggestions for fixing our 
our broken sum function. Fine? Is there a way to get the two threads to write to like two different local variables? Yes, so that's an excellent idea. We could have the threads not try to fight for the same location in memory. Uh, so that, that's one way that we'll explore. Um, let me note it down. And something we'll have to figure out for this is if they're writing to the local variables, they need some way to like share their final results. Because if it only stays in the local variable, it can't. It is never sort of made available to the program, but definitely a, a good possibility. Lev? Uh, for either the write to local variables or what we currently have, if you mark the adding to the global sum as the critical section, then that would kind of solve the problem. And how might we mark it as a critical section? New text. Yes, we could use a mutex uh, to uh, prevent, uh, to, to make this an atomic operation, to make it so that only one thread is adding to this global variable at a time. Uh, any other possibilities? Nick? Do both those things. Uh, use a mutex and write to local variables? So like, yeah, write to local variables first and then write at the end. Use a mutex to update a global sum. Yeah, so. We could update a global kind of at the end after we use local variables. Um, fine. Could we. This is really weird, but could we have. Um, one piggy back sort of off the other, where they, one of them, no, I mean, I guess that would just, it would fall to the mutex. Mutex would be, mutex would tag the entirety of reading, adding, and writing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, also throw up here, We have them write to different global variables rather than the same one. So, yeah, Angela? Yeah, so let's look at what each of these would look like. And Angela's absolutely right. If we have some uh, global mutex here, if we're kind of doing it in the p thread way, Do that by calling p thread mutex log, and we give it a pointer to some global variable mutex that is this shared lock that all threads are using. Then, once we've gotten the lock, we do our addition, and then P thread mutex unlock, give it a pointer to the mutex. And like we've been saying, the region between the lock and the unlock is what we call the critical section, the region of code that we only want one thread in at a time. Okay? So, what? So, so, so the global is put down the uh, block, right? What that's actually do is, hey, as soon as you enter this for you, make sure that there's only one thread accessing global sum at this moment. Yes. Then, then it's, it's kind of like pretty easy. Like, you want to be through the thread, right? And then we'll run through the whole thing, and then we can go. Are you saying? Oh, oh. Uh, it looked like you had a question. Well, I mean, I think, uh, wouldn't that just, I feel like this is the point you're trying to get to, that um, that wouldn't speed it up? I mean, that would, that would get rid of the point of multi-threading? Yes. This solution, where now 
we basically forced all of these additions to be sequential, like no two of them can happen at the same time. Uh, we've basically created a single threaded program with more overhead with all this locking and unlocking. So in this situation where, like the, the kind of situation where this, this mutex really makes sense, is let's say you have some shared data structure, like multiple threads are using a shared linked list, and they're adding to the linked list and removing from the linked list. Uh, and they're not doing this like constantly in some loop, they're just doing it maybe every once in a while. And if two threads try and add or remove from the linked list at the same time, they could end up sort of overwriting pointers and the linked list becomes uh, uh, messed up. So in that case, you would use a mutex to kind of protect the shared data structure. You require the, the mutex before doing any linked list operation and then release it at the end so that the linked list isn't subject to a data race. When we have just like a single spot in memory that we want to modify using a mutex to pr protect that, certainly when we're just modifying it all at once inside a loop, not a good strategy performance-wise. But it has a distinct advantage of our previous approach in which it actually gives us the correct answer as opposed to the incorrect answer. The first version was correct if we just had one thread, because then there was none of this interference. But as soon as we got more than one thread, our previous version just gave us the wrong sum. Whereas this one at least gives us the right sum, even though it's uh, uh, it can be quite quite slow. I mean, we're uh, and it gets slower the more threads we have, because then there are more threads fighting for this lock. So while our, I'll show you a, a chart, uh, but our kind of race condition took a couple seconds. Our mutex version takes 20 seconds. So really not not the efficient choice here. Uh, on this. Is it never going to be faster to do this kind of task with multiple threads in the same process? Uh, Yes, uh, these two solutions will actually improve performance, and as we'll see, writing to a local variable is going to be the clear, clear winner. Uh, yeah. Like, what do other threads have access to that the original thread would, that would make it faster? Um, yeah. So I, uh, I, the next thing I will show is like what what these two cases are doing and how they are accessing. Um, uh, data at the same time, but before I get there, any other questions on the mutex version? Fine. No, no. Okay, Marcus. Um, so would you still sort of achieve the same result as mutex if you just wrote it, if you just locked it outside the for loop, just right outside the for loop? Um, yeah, we could move this long and long outside the, the um, for loop, which would mean that one thread would do all its additions, and then the other thread would do all of its. When we have a lock inside the for loop, the thread the threads could kind of switch back and forth, each doing their additions, uh, but they wouldn't kind of overwrite each other. Uh, actually, putting them outside the for loop would even more clearly defeat the purpose of having multiple threads. But it would probably be faster than putting them inside the loop, just because there would be fewer calls to lock and unlock. All right, so let's see. What would it look like to use different global variables? We'll, we'll work our way up to our local variables. For this, we're going to, instead of having a single global variable, uh, we're going to have a global array where elements of the, where in different elements of this global array are where each thread is putting its results. So it would look something like We, the thread, in addition to knowing its start and end um, indices, uh, it would need to know kind of which index in this global sum that has kind of a spot for each thread. Uh, its index is just going to be 
its ID. So thread zero will use index zero of this global array. Thread one will use index one. And we'll just accumulate the results from thread zero in the first index of PSUM, accumulate the results from thread one in index one. Uh, and then outside of the multi-threaded code, basically after both threads have finished, the original the, the original process will just go through and add up the elements of PSUM, but there's going to just be a handful of these, like two of them for two threads. So uh, that's uh, kind of only a, a very tiny, tiny amount of work compared to adding up uh, all of all of these numbers. Questions on it? Um, yeah, I guess, could you explain again the code you through flat axis and some of the Yeah, so before we had a variable global sum, which was just a kind of single memory location, a single number, and both threads were hitting the same location as a computed this sum. And what we've done is instead of having a global array where thread zero accesses index zero of the array and thread one accesses index one and so they have kind of separate memory locations where they're computing their sum. And so when both threads have finished, we have kind of each thread's individual sum in this global array, and we can just add these two numbers together to get the final result. Does that make sense? So this, this is running on, okay, so it's running on threads. Oh, index equals five. Yeah, this was, yeah, we're, we're adding the numbers from like start up to end, as we had thread one going from zero to two to the 29th. Thing. So the index is given. This. Yeah, the index is just equals the thread ID, so that's zero for thread zero, one for thread one, and so on. Other questions? All right, so there is one uh, kind of tricky issue that comes up here that relates to caching. Does anyone remember kind of how caches interact? with memory. Like if I have a single integer, is that what is being kind of uh, loaded into the cache? What? We work with pages. So uh, if you want a single integer, you have to access the entire page and bring it into a cache level. Yeah, when, we, when we're dealing with virtual memory, it's these big chunks called pages. When we're dealing with caches, it's block, they're called blocks, and they tend to be smaller than pages, but exactly the same idea. We bring kind of blocks of data at a time. And it turns out that if we have two integers next to each other in memory, they're going to be part of the same block. Uh, and when we're dealing with multiple threads, they actually inter they like have to wait for the other thread to access the same cache block. Uh, so in practice, we'll want to put some amount of space between these two memory locations to get them to be in different cache blocks. Uh, and uh, for this particular scenario, if we set it up, so we have just eight bytes of padding between our two, uh, uh, the two spots we're accumulating the sums for each thread, that will eliminate this sort of fighting over the same cache block. Uh, there's nothing like this eight is just what ha what is appropriate in this particular situation on Mantis where I tested this. But the thing that I would like to, to take away is that kind of optimizing the performance of multi-threaded code is quite challenging and depends on a lot of these factors of like how they interact with caches and how exactly they're sharing memory. Thank you. So if thread one accesses some memory location, sorry, if thread zero accesses some memory location, this four byte integer is part of some larger cache block. And the way that 
the x86 architecture works is that when one core accesses a cache block, the other cores are not allowed to access that at the same time. Because if they were, then the caches on two different cores could become inconsistent, have two different values for the same location in memory, and that would cause chaos. So the idea is if these two integers are next to each other in memory, they'll be part of the same cache block, and we'll have this false sharing where they can't actually access it at the same time. But if we separate them by some amount, in this case 8 bytes, they'll end up in different cache blocks, and they will actually be able to write to these two simultaneously. Other questions? Fine. So how do we control that? How do we get that to how do we insert that? Or is that part of the architecture that happens on that? Uh, no, it's when you're setting up T sum. You would put enough element, you would figure out how much spacing do I need, and use that to figure out how many elements should you put into uh, the array, and then when getting this what index each thread should use in this global array, you would incorporate kind of how much space should be between them. Um, so you basically have to like carefully set up the global array uh, to make this work. So yeah, it's it's quite kind of manual and, and messy to make it make it happen. Yeah. So if you if you just had and basically if you had an array of these numbers from zero to two different arrays, mm -hmm. you would in fact have to make to actually sum it, you'd have to make an entirely new array with these like blocks of padding in between the sections of those numbers. Um, so this array with the padding is just the results from each thread. So it doesn't need to have like zero to two to the thirtieth. It needs like a spot for each thread with some padding in between. Um, so it's not going to be that big um, because we're not likely we're not going to like the benefits to having more than uh, a dozen threads are likely going to be pretty small. Okay. So it's uh, the the cache thing is the problem for reading and it's problem for right? Yeah. It's it's. It's when we have this like global, it comes back to like we have shared global data. And it turns out the way in which it's shared efficiently actually depends on whether two cores are accessing the same cache block or not. All right. The local variable, pretty straightforward. If we have. The sum variable may be called local sum. We add to that in the array, and then after we've done all of that, we still have a global array with a spot for each thread's results, but we only write to that once at the very end rather than each time we do the addition. What will, will, will be the value of that? Like just for uh, so this local variable, where is it likely to be stored? Yeah. It might be stored on the stack. Is there somewhere else it might be stored? Uh, the literals? Is it the literals? Uh, it will be. It could be in the stack. Um, so that's memory. Is there somewhere else left? It could be in a register. It could be in a register. And if it's in a register, which is very likely because we're using it through this loop, so it will just be loaded. We'll just be adding the results to at the same register each time. That's going to be way, way better than going to memory every single time to do the addition. So this summing up in a local variable. Actually, let's us sum it up in a register, which is the most efficient thing that we could do. Kevin? Okay. So that kind of great. So after you run the thing, you can make some, and that that will sum the index. Um, then after that, you just add all the index to the actual sum. Yeah. Oh. OK. Um, so just to put some actual numbers to all of this. Here is a chart 
of these four different methods. So race is the first thing that we tried. Uh, and the x-axis here is the number of threads. And the y-axis is how many seconds it took to compute this sum. Uh, and one thing to notice is that for all of these, there's kind of diminishing returns as we add more and more threads. Uh, and that is because the total time the program takes, uh, it's not the fact case that 100% of it is computing this sum. There's other stuff this program is doing. It's creating each thread. It's destroying each thread. It's printing out the final results, and so on and so forth. So the part that we're actually splitting up among the multiple threads is not all of the program's running time. And so kind of, the more threads we add, that may decrease the amount of time the, the computing the sum takes, but it doesn't decrease the time the rest of it takes. Uh, and so we, we see a kind of limited benefit from that. But uh, we do see that kind of the global versus adding spacing between uh, uh, the kind of spots in memory difference as we're running to gives us uh, improvement. And then if we're summing up in a register, uh, it's very, very fast. Any other questions on this? Oh. Yes, so this was me uh, running each of these three times and taking the fastest one. Oh, okay. Um, and basically, whenever you are measuring how long a program takes, there's going to be some noise based on what else is running on the system. Uh, all sorts of different things can, uh, can affect this. So if you want kind of robust measurements, you do it a whole bunch of times and take the average, something like that. So yeah, it's not, but it's still not unusual to see some noise in general. Uh, okay. global space again? Global space is we add some unused padding between the spots in this global array each thread is using to get them to be in separate cache blocks. Other questions? All right, I think that means that it is time for me to tell you about the uh, first satellite the US put into orbit, the Explorer 1. Um, uh, it, uh, I think, orbited uh, for uh, four months before uh, collecting data, before it ran out of uh, power. Um, and this was uh, a big deal, we can get, um, have a, a sense of uh, the how it was viewed at the time. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Army's Jupiter C rocket is ready for America's second attempt to launch a space satellite. No relation to the IRBM Jupiter, this is a rebuilt Redstone, a 200 mile missile carrying, instead of a warhead, three stages of solid fuel booster rockets and the Explorer, a six foot bullet only inches across. Uh, and uh, the U.S. government was very uh, anxious to get a satellite in space because the year before, uh, the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik, and then in fact Sputnik 2, a second satellite, uh, and uh, there were people could could go outside uh, in the U.S. and at the right time, I looked up and see Sputnik kind of traveling across the sky, and people were. were very freaked out about uh, about this whole situation and nukes and, and whatnot. So uh, the U.S. really needed to to uh, get into space. Here is the actual satellite, kind of minus all the the fuel and engines that we're going to get up here. Quite small. Uh, and here are kind of uh, three guys who kind of led different parts of the the project. Uh, you had Bill Pickering, who I uh, uh, was in charge of designing the, the, the actual spacecraft, um, headed the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for a long time. Uh, you had, um, good as first name, but Van Allen, uh, a scientist uh, from Iowa who uh, designed kind of the scientific part of the mission and discovered these bands of radiation, which are now called uh, Van Allen radiation, uh, that sit around the Earth. Uh, and you had uh, Werner von Braun, a former Nazi who 
the U.S. Uh, uh, put to work making uh, making rockets uh, because he had headed up the uh, German rocket program. Uh, this was common for a lot of uh, German scientists um, were uh, put to uh, were went, went to work in, in laboratories and uh, in other countries. Uh, and just because space is cool, here's the first uh, mission that visited Jupiter, uh, the Pioneer 10. This is an artist's uh, rendition in, the, in, I think, 1973. Uh, it kind of flew by uh, Ganymede before kind of looping around Jupiter and, and going on its way. Captured uh, this image of Jupiter and this uh, crystal clear image of Ganymede. Um, <laughs> But fortunately, we've we've gone back, and the Juno mission in 2021 uh, got this picture of Ganymede, which is uh, quite a bit better. Uh, it may look like rock, but this is actually solid ice uh, on the surface of this moon. Many of the moons of, of Jupiter have these kind of solid ice shells, and we think that there's large liquid oceans beneath the ice um, in some of them. Particularly, uh, Europa is of particular interest because the ice shell might actually be thin enough that you could get to the ocean. Bye. Um, with this satellite, it, when it ran out of fuel, did it come back down, or is it still up there? Uh, I don't think it's still up there. I think that I read that it orbited until like 1977, and I assume at that point, kind of, it had dipped. Its orbit had dipped low enough that atmospheric drag brought it down to the Earth. But there are lots and lots of non-operational satellites still floating around up there. All right, so. With uh, our last bit of time, I want to talk a bit about uh, Java versus C. Uh, so one of uh, the key differences C code, we compile it, and we get x86 assembly, um, uh, sometimes called a native binary, meaning an executable that includes the assembly instructions kind of native to whatever system it's running on. We compile Java code, we get an intermediate representation of the code called Java bytecode, which we can think of as a kind of uh, a kind of form of assembly specific to. this program called the Java Virtual Machine. And the Java Virtual Machine is kind of interpreting the, this Java bytecode. And then on an x86 system, is what is actually producing the x86 assembly instructions that cause kind of memory and, and of all the stuff that we want the program to do to actually happen. Um, and this step right here, where we have some representation of Java, and then kind of at the time when we run the program, this Java bytecode is kind of fed into this Java virtual machine. That's often described as interpreted, meaning that at the time when we run the Java program, its bytecode is read by the Java virtual machine and interpreted kind of in real time uh, to run the program. So there are some benefits and downsides to, to this approach. Uh, any ideas about what potential pros or cons might be? What? I mean, I think there's a lot of overhead. Um, 
So uh, we definitely have, there are more layers, so we, it's right to be worried about more overhead. Um, and for this reason, kind of, people often think of, well, C is just faster than Java, period. Um, and that's certainly true in some cases, uh, but it really depends on the specifics of the program that you're writing. Like if you take a single program that is fast in C, it might be slow in Java. But you would definitely write a program that is faster in Java than it is in C because they just represent memory differently, they have different kinds of operations, uh, and so it's a little difficult to do a true sort of apples to apples comparison. Uh, but yes, we definitely, overhead would be a concern. Awesome. When you say you write a program, you mean, and like, and like you write it to the other, you mean like, like exactly the same program, or a program that fulfills the same purpose? I don't know. Uh, I mean, because you would have to do some translation of C to Java yeah. or Java to C. So I'm taking, kind of taking a program and creating its, like, the most, the closest version of it you can in the other one. I guess, yeah, my question is, like, is like C better in, like, than, like, doing some things than Java, or? Uh, so, one thing about C that we have made extensive use of is C gives the programmer a lot of very fine-grained control over memory. We can control what is stack allocated, what is heap allocated, exactly how things are laid out in memory, sort of all of these details, we have a lot of control over that in C. Uh, not necessarily the case in Java. Uh, and so if we're in a situation where we need really close control of memory, then C is useful in that way. For uh, uh, writing an operating system kernel, for example, that has to uh, uh, it kind of interacted at a very low level with memory and hardware and all of this. Uh, C can be can be helpful for that. Um, but for example, um, when we have an array in C, we say you know, int x five, we get uh, kind of five ints kind of four bytes apart and no initialization performed on any of these. Uh, in Java, if we do kind of int array x equals new int five, what we get is an array of five integers, all initialized to zero, and the array also stores in its memory representation the length of the array. This length of the array means that the Java virtual machine can check every access to this array and make sure that it's not going to go past the end. And so this will kind of just remove an entire category of memory and buffer overflow bugs by keeping track of the length and checking it each time. And having a programming language just remove entire categories of bugs from even being possible in your programs is very useful if you're interested in writing, you know, software that performs correctly. Other benefits or yeah. So I think uh, the actual layer of JVM makes Java multi-platform because you can basically, like, you don't have to care about whether you're using an ARM structure or x86 structure. You can always run Java. Exactly. That in this picture, our C code has to be appropriate to whatever assembly we're compiling it to. And if it's something other than x86, it's a different operating system, we might have to change a bunch of things about our C code to be compatible. But our Java code just has to be compatible with the Java virtual machine. And then there could be a Java virtual machine for Linux and for Windows and for different architectures. And the Java code doesn't have to, have to change at all. It just has to match the Java virtual machine, which is not changing. Okay. Wait, but then to that point, you go, 
Can you just change the compiler to so like G to the same class? Uh, so we would need a different compiler, but there may be aspects of the C code that also need to change. For example, the names of the system calls are different. Uh, or um, there may you may need to structure operations in a different way to be more efficient on this other architecture. And these are all sorts of details that the JVM can take care of, and your Java code doesn't doesn't need to worry about. Like I say. Uh, but don't you need like C code or like other languages to like uh, yes, yeah, so the JVM, uh, there are many different implementations, but the standard one is actually implemented in C++. Uh, so yes, yeah, someone had to write the Java virtual machine, but now writing Java code can, can benefit from all the things built into that. Fine. Um, the thing about C code is it's a one-time compilation, right? And with Java, the byte code is one time, but the virtual machine does it do it once for whatever machine it's on, or is it real time interpreting? Um, it's often real time, but there are ways to compile it ahead of time. Um, but yes, that's a big source of why some Java programs are slower than the equivalent C, because this interpretation is having to happen at runtime. Uh, and like uh, Java, Python is also an interpreted language. And so Python also has sort of, um, uh, you, there's actually a disassemble uh, module in the Python standard library that you can use on your Python code to see the sort of lower level instructions that are getting sent to the Python interpreter uh, as it runs that code. Well, Wait, so, uh, so you said Java is a interpreted thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, okay. Um, okay. Um, one other kind of interesting uh, difference is when we're talking about uh, a C string. Um, what what is a, a C string in memory? Array right, of characters. How many bytes is each character? One, one. one byte. Uh, so if I have the string hello, is it just these five bytes? Plus one. Uh, plus our null terminator. Uh, in our Java string, uh, we have like the array, the length of the string stored is kind of part of, of the string representation in memory. Uh, and Java also uses um, a two byte system of characters called UTF-16. Where C used ASCII, these one byte characters, Java uses UTF-16, or it's sometimes called Unicode, and this is just each character is two bytes. So in the case of, of this, uh, the ASCII, uh, the UTF-16 representation of ASCII is just the all the same values with zeros in the other byte. But this UTF-16 can represent basically all the world's alphabets, whereas ASCII definitely cannot. So it would be kind of uh, H. 0, E, 0, L, 0, and so on. So this, this string would actually take up considerably more memory uh, in Java than in C, but be able to represent a much wider range of characters, and also it has the length, so same deal with kind of checking the bounds of, of the string. All right, that's all we're going to have time for today. So uh, happy Ultimate Monday. Uh, quiz 8 is available on Moodle. Uh, it's one question, should be very quick. Uh, so hopefully that will, will not be a, a source of stress as the due date for that pod approaches on Wednesday. Five office hours uh, as normal this week. I uh, will see you on Wednesday.